three years ago today, we finally left the EU. Well, time flies when you're having fun. The Big Thing on Times Radio. Tonight, we are leaving the European Union. This is the dawn of a new era. Five, four, three, two, one. Celebrate tonight as we've never done before the greatest moment in the modern history of our... Today, we're going to answer your questions about what has happened since. We are live on the Times website and on the Times Radio YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to watch along uh, as we answer your questions. Uh, Times subscribers have been sending in uh, your questions through the thetimes.co.uk. And we're joined by a cracking panel who are going to try and uh, pick their way through them. Henry Zeffman is Associate Political Editor of the Times in the, in the studio with me this morning. Nice to see you, Henry. Lovely to see you, Matt. Uh, we've got Maureen Khan, Times Economics Editor. Morning, Maureen. Hello. And live from Brussels, Bruno Waterfield, the Times of Brussels correspondent here as well. Hi, Bruno. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, oh, it's like it's like your vision, this, but less fun. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, let's start with uh, the sort of the big picture question. We've had absolutely loads. Uh, it won't surprise you uh, of people asking, can we judge Brexit to have been a success or a failure? Graham in uh, Alcester. Our sister says nobody understood the consequences of leaving and slightly more understand the impact now. What questions should we, the public, be asking politicians to explain whether or not it was a success? Sue in Limington says, has Brexit been positive in any area? And in fact, uh, during this month's Times Radio focus group, we asked uh, swing voters from Chippenham, Southport and Newcastle how they thought Brexit had gone. And this is what they said. I, I think it, yeah. <laughs> it didn't go to plan. That say, for example, the price of beans, it was Brexit three years ago that was the problem. Then it became COVID was the problem. And now it's the government's the problem. But it's equally just as rubbish, but we just don't know who to blame anymore. I don't think it's been great. I think a lot of the promises made haven't really come off. And I think people struggle to think of any real positives of why we've left. We're left without a plan and without a strategy. We've lost that many people that went back to a place like Poland and Romania that they're never going to be able to fill fill the spots. So that was what the focus group said. Henry, this feels like one for you, the pol the politics. Uh, can we judge it for being a success or failure? And if not, when can we? Or what should, as uh, Graham asked, what should he be asking politicians? Well, I think it is not unreasonable for voters to judge the government against the promises made by Vote Leave, is the truth. Um, and that's a slightly tricky thing to do because Vote Leave will say, ah, oh, well, you know, we weren't the government. Uh, you know, we had Gisela Stewart, who was a Labour MP at the time. And, uh, you know, Boris Johnson was the de facto leader of Vote Leave, but no one had heard of Rishi Sunak in 2016. Um, although, of course, he was a Leave-supporting Conservative MP. Um, however, um, I do think, though this was not necessarily in the foreground of the Leave campaign, um, that the time frame is complicated. I mean, I think even on, on the Leave campaign's prospectus, you know, they would have seen this as a medium-term, long-term project. Um, and so whether it is fair to judge uh, Brexit um, at the, you know, first general election, which takes place after the UK leaves the EU, um, which is going to come next year, uh, or not, is a separate question. But, you know, in reality... Um, the government is going to be judged on what has happened since 2016 at the next general election, at least in part. Uh, and we know from the polling, which I'm sure we'll come on to, uh, that most British people don't think they've handled it very well. I suppose the problem is, the, the, because it's very difficult to do things in isolation and have the parallel universe where we didn't leave the EU and therefore establish, well, how much of what's happened, and we'll talk about the economy in a moment, but how much has happened as a result of the pandemic, how much has happened as a result of uh, the, the, the general state of the nation's finances, how much 
uh, as a result of Brexit was two years of nothing happening or three years of nothing happening under Theresa May. You know, it's really difficult to uh, and lost opportunity cost of other things they could have been doing were they not arguing about Brexit. Well, you you, you heard there that clip from your brilliant focus group uh, with the guest talking about. Uh, the price of beans and effectively saying that it was hard to disentangle the effects, the economic effects, the inflationary effects of uh, COVID, of Brexit, of, you know, I guess the mini budget. And I think the same is true politically. I think it is hard for voters, um, it's hard for journalists to disentangle different things the government has done from the chaos of grappling with the pandemic, from the uh, instability of the Conservative Party from the chaos of the fact that Boris Johnson was Prime Minister. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that is a tricky thing to do when you are judging the success of Brexit, but was always going to be thus, you know, politics doesn't happen. or Certain policies, sets of policies don't happen yeah. in an isolation. If the government can't conjure a convincing narrative that the Brexit part of what they've been doing for the last few years has at least been successful, then they're going to lose. Bruno, what's the view in Brussels? Because obviously Brussels want it to have been a failure because they want to show that it was a bad idea Britain leaving. Do they, do they think they've been successful in making it a failure? No, I don't, think, I don't think they would see it as them making it a failure. Their narrative would be these are consequences of um, Britain leaving. But at the same time, they're realistic. At the same time, they would recognise that many of the consequences or the negative aspects of Brexit aren't simply just to do um, with um, Britain uh, leaving the European um, Union. Many other European countries face similar problems, they face labour shortages, high cost of living. Today, there's a big national demonstration of trade unionists um, here in Brussels because of the labour shortages um, in the care sector. That's hospitals, creches um, and social care, very big sectors uh, here in Belgium where there are labour shortages and, and, and problems uh, in terms of the cost so many of the problems that Britain is having at the moment economically are reproduced um, across Europe, although Europe has, not as the EU, but different governments have responded uh, in different ways, for example, um, with very high levels of, of, of public spending, which goes against the ideology uh, currently of the Treasury um, and the Conservative Party. So it's very hard to disentangle how the government has handled Brexit and the, the, and the economy and the current uh, consequences we see at the moment, I think what the EU would see it as a vindication of is a vindication of um, their very negative views about people like Boris Johnson as a charlatan and as a, a chancellor. And they would point to the current state of Britain and say, this is what you get when you have people like that in charge. I mean, let's come on to the economy because it, it won't surprise me. Loads of the questions we had touched on the economy. Uh, uh, Beryl says, what effect has Brexit had on our exports to and from the EU? Uh, John says, would the UK, UK have been better off by now with a Brexit based on WTO trade rules? David, what's the approximate value of the trade deals made post-Brexit compared to the, uh, the business loss with the EU? Uh, all of these sort of, I think, trying to point to showing that uh, Brexit has been good or bad uh, for the economy. Are you able to in disentangle that? Is there another country that was quite a lot like Britain, which hasn't, which obviously has been through the pandemic and everything else, but hasn't had Brexit that we can sort of use as a comparator? That's actually a very good question. And this is um, an exercise which is done by the excellent John Springford, who works for the Centre for European Reform. And I'd encourage everyone who wants to know about the counterfactual Britain still in the EU, what would have happened to that Britain compared to Britain now. And John does this exercise every six months where he basically composes a phantom version of Britain, which is based on things uh, that other countries similar to Britain uh, are experiencing and then compares it to the UK. He sees... Um, that we have had a growth downgrade of about 5%, which is generally in line with the forecasts that we already have from people like the um, Office of Budget Responsibility, which say the economy or productivity is about 4 to 5% smaller. And it's important to know that these are sort of, these um, the losses to productivity are something, is something that's already gone and has been crystallized. It's not something necessarily that we're still sort of facing. So these are the sort of the, the lost growth opportunities that have happened because of Brexit. John also finds that we have quite a major investment gap. He thinks it's around 11% compared to when the UK was in the EU and whether it's not out, outside the EU, the sort of counterfactual. And actually one of the more surprising findings is that the impact to trade on goods has been less severe than a lot of people would have predicted. Um, I will have to double check, but I think John 
bronze figures are somewhere around 7%, which is of a lower intensity than maybe um, the double digit figures that we would have expected in the case of trade with and services um, trade with the EU had we stayed in the, stayed in the block. So actually, I think economists are now becoming much more creative about actually doing this process of disentangling. They are trying to work out what is the impact of the labour market that has come from the pandemic and that has come from Brexit. That's not always very simple. So, for example, if you have, as we saw, many European Union nationals who left the UK during lockdown, uh, which was a pretty uncertain time, if they then did not come back to the UK, is that an effect of Brexit or is that because of the pandemic? So there are still some complications, but we know that we have a smaller labour market. The trade intensity of the UK as a country is about 15% lower. We do less trade in goods with the EU. We have less EU EU nationals coming in um, to the European uh, to the UK, which means we have a smaller population relative to what it would have been if we'd stayed in. So I think economists who were also suffering a little bit from, um, I think, an unwillingness to talk about what the effects of Brexit are. And uh, now three years on, having some data, being able to come up with models which look at the differences of in and out, uh, are coming up with some forecasts and, and sort of making the job of, of people like me much easier when we talk about the economic impact of Brexit to actually have some empirics yeah. to start referring to. Is it, and on the on the trade deals front, I don't know if it's one for Marina, one for Henry, I know it sort of follows these things from the political angle. At the very beginning, we were told by the likes of David Davis and Liam Fox, we were going to do trade deals, it was going to be a piece of cake, the easiest deals ever struck, the one with the EU and with with other countries. And before you know it, we're, we're supposed to be thrilled with sending chocolate biscuits in New Zealand or something. Um, where are we on those trade deals? Have they come close to replacing what was there before the the opportunity of being able to strike our own trade trade deals has that outweighed the benefit of being in the eu well in in simple gdp terms uh no they they haven't replaced what was there before i think although marine will know much better than me but i mean look politically i i, th I think it is simply incontrovertible to say that the sort of boosterish talk of uh, Brexiteers in the run-up to Brexit, but also in the aftermath about how easy it would to would be to strike free trade deals um, ha has been disproved. And, you know, partly they were true, that they were disproved about the deal with the EU. I mean, remember that, you know, that sort of famous David Davis article for Conservative Home before he became Brexit Secretary about how, you know, the first call the Prime Minister would make after the UK left the EU would be to Angela Merkel about cutting a deal. I mean, you know, so they were wrong um, not just about how easy it would be to strike these deals, but also about the mechanics of how the EU in particular would approach them. They had this concept that it would be a sort of bilateral leader-to-leader -leader negotiation with Germany, which they really saw as driving the EU. And of course, in many respects, it does. Um, and they were wrong about that. The other point in which they were completely wrong, um, of course, was America. Uh, we were told repeatedly by uh, successive prime ministers uh, that, that the UK would strike a rapid free trade deal with America. Um, Theresa May went and held Donald Trump's hand and yet uh, it, it, it got nowhere even under even under Donald Trump, even yeah. with Robert Lighthizer, this Reagan, Reaganite trade negotiation. It's, it's sure as anything not going to happen under Joe Biden. Um, one of the, uh, on this question, is really interesting on the economy and Maureen and uh, Bruno, you might want to come on to this. Uh, Julian in Durham says, for some Brexit voters, leaving the EU wasn't just about the impact on the UK. It was also intended to harm or perhaps even destroy the EU. My question is, what impact? Uh, what has been the impact of Brexit on the EU? Um, Bruno, is there any sort of countries within, still within the EU, I suspect the ones probably nearest to us, but in terms of being angry that Britain left because of the impact it's had on the economies of EU countries? Well, no, I think the, the, the impact of the UK leaving was always... Uh, more um, political um, EU countries or EU member states, EU governments were pretty happy, but it was so uncomfortable for the Conservatives because that was seen as a salutary lesson uh, to other political parties who, who might play uh, the same, uh, might play the same games. Now, actually, in terms of the EU, Britain's absence is felt by countries like Germany or the Netherlands or the Nordics because the balance has shifted away from pro-market countries to countries uh, or an ally or camps dominated by France that are more state interventionist, more pro-subsidy, uh, more about fixing markets and letting markets um, work. So political consequences of Britain leaving are very much um, still felt, but the idea of contagion, the idea that it's going to be a queue at the door of countries uh, wanting to leave, be it uh, Poland, be it 
the Netherlands or whatever, that's simply yeah. not happening. Having said that, the political discontents within the European Union and Euroscepticism is still very much alive and well. It's Maybe if I just jump yeah, in on, yeah, on, course, on this yeah, point, yeah, yeah. Um, um, it, I think it was very notable that when Liz Truss issued her mini budget, um, one of the, uh, I think, biggest inadvertent beneficiaries of it was the European Union, because at the same time, only a few weeks earlier, you had a apparently iconoclastic Italian prime minister who was ready to rip up Italy's budget commitments and go full ham on a, on a growth plan that would break um, the Eurozone's budget rules. Having seen what happened to Liz Truss, um, uh, Georgia Maloney became a very well-behaved adherent to the EU's economic orthodoxies. <laughs> so there's many ironies about what impact. I think the Brussels think the repeated mistakes and political misjudgments of the UK's political class have had inadvertently, uh, in a good sense, uh, um, uh, for the European Union by one, just making it very clear what the dangers are of being outside the bloc, uh, being on your own, as it were, and also trying to test the limit and appetite of the markets when you do not have the full trust or the financial um, public um, finance stability that you would need uh, as a big country, something the UK enjoyed for a very long time and has been whittled away because of Brexit. It's interesting. At least there's some benefit of Liz Truss, uh, albeit for the Italians. Uh, right, in a moment, we're going to do, we'll take some more of your questions. We'll talk about red tape and uh, rejoin. Is that ever likely to happen? Uh, we're answering your Brexit questions three years after Britain officially left the EU. We'll answer more of your questions next. Mariella Frostrup on Times Radio. As the first anniversary of the war in Ukraine approaches, I'll be talking to the award-winning documentary maker Norma Percy about her latest series, Putin versus the West. He's the latest in a long line of world leaders she's zoomed in on in her long career. Others include Barack Obama, Boris Johnson and Vladimir Zelensky. We'll also get the pick of the week's TV. And in Life and Times, we remember one quarter of Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, the brilliant songwriter David Crosby. All that, plus the latest news, views and analysis. Mariella Frostrup, this afternoon from 1 on Times Radio. With TalkTalk, Talk, you can speed up and spend less on broadband in 2023. Out of contract on Superfast Fibre? Double your speed and save, on average, £125 over 18 months by upgrading to TalkTalk Talk Full Fibre 150. That's just £29.95 a month, plus no setup fees. Search TalkTalk Talk Full Fibre for deals that make sense sense. TalkTalk. Talk. CPI plus 3.7% annual increase from April 2023, subject to local availability. Average saving on full fibre 150 versus major competitors publicly available out of contract. Standard fibre 65 equivalent only on 21st October. The TUI Live Happy Sale is back. At TUI, we have great offers on loads of holidays. Here we come. You could save up to £250 per booking, plus pay monthly with a £0 deposit. Dreamy. All at all protected. TUI, live happy. Booking T's and C's apply, selected departures, minimum spend applies, direct debit minimum 26 weeks from departure. See website for details. Times Radio with Matt Chorley. A very good morning to you, Matt Chorley on Times Radio. Answering your Brexit questions, still joined by Henry Zeffman, Associate Political Editor of The Times, uh, Maureen Carnes, the Economics Editor. And Bruno Waterfield is the Brussels correspondent. Uh, right, uh, we've been answering the questions of Times readers. We can now speak to Nick in York. Nick, are you there? Yes, but yes. Uh, it's nice to be with you and your esteemed panel. Very good. Uh, thank you, Nick. What's your question? Basically, quickly, it's just to do with how free are we of EU regulation so far? Uh, is there any chance that we will actually get rid of most or all of them? Um, in particular, I'm thinking of things like uh, something I'm interested in. There, there was something about alternative health practitioners being more kind of constrained and things like vitamin supplements being um, sort of um, affected, uh, the availability, that kind of thing that was uh, threatened to be um, subsumed in the uh, EU or maybe it already happened and i just wonder how how quickly we're we getting rid of that kind of yeah, thing yeah. That it, that's already happened thank you for that nick let me go to i don't know how henry's in-depth knowledge of uh, vitamin regulation but more on the on the broader question i mean richie sunak when he ran for the toy leadership posed putting eu regulations through a shredder so where are we on that process it's going to happen this year uh well sorry i don't know about the shredder specifically but the <laughs> uh, the repeal of something like four thousand pieces of remaining EU-derived laws um, are going to be repealed this year, at least under Rishi Sunak's plans. Whether that's actually going to happen um, is another question. Uh, it's going to be a vote in the House of Commons at some point. 
Uh, and we're expecting rebellion not just from, well, not just opposition from the opposition, from Labour, as you'd expect, but also rebellion from Tory MPs. Yeah. Uh, Robert Buckland, who was a noted Remainer, but actually also David Davis, former Brexit secretary, um, because they're saying that just sort of repealing these en masse um, doesn't allow the level of parliamentary scrutiny um, which the sovereignty part of Brexit was meant to restore. Um, so in, in practice, I think increasingly this idea of repealing almost all these laws by the end of the year is seen in, in some Whitehall departments as a, basically an impossible task. Uh, but look, that's what the government is committed to. So it's absolutely going to be a running theme this year. There you are. So we're, we're, we're making progress, Nick, but exactly how we go about uh, repealing them or just copying and pasting them into it, B British law um, is still to be decided. So, but yeah, I'm not sure what's going to happen to your vitamins. <laughs> uh, anyway, good. thanks very much for joining us, Nick. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye-bye. Uh, let's talk about... We had loads and loads... The team putting together all the Times Readers questions. So we had loads and loads from people who've got a home in Europe. I told you something about the uh, calibre of Times Readers. Uh, Patricia uh, in uh, the north of England says... Uh, oh, no, no, it was De Je fact, Jane in London said, why did the UK government... There's probably one for you, Bruno... Why did the UK government not negotiate the same freedom of movement rules for UK citizens that EU citizens enjoy when visiting the UK? EU citizens can visit the UK for six months without a visa, whereas UK citizens are locked into the 90 to 180 days rule when visiting the EU. And people who had second homes and thought they could go and spend months and months and months there have to keep coming back now, don't they? Is that right? Well, I mean, they've got... They've, they've, under the rules, they've got 90 and 100... And, um, 80 days. Now, I guess if you're retired, um, that might be a problem for most of us um, in the world of wage labour, then that, 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 that would <laughs> be generous to me. It is just the standard rule. I mean, that's how visa arrangements uh, work. The UK uh, has made its own uh, arrangement. That's, that's up to um, the UK. I think it is an area, the whole mobility question also for school trips and musicians, that will be and can be uh, revisited under the TCA, under the trade and cooperation agreement. But I think before that happens, um, then the UK has got to sort out the real, or Lance, the real boil it has um, with the EU, which is, the Nor is Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Yeah, of course, which, which we haven't uh, uh, touched on that at all. Uh, <laughs> partly because we're trying to focus on the things that actually happened. Uh, let's move on, because uh, I've got uh, only a few more minutes left, and I want to talk about uh, the question of rejoin. Loads and loads saying... Uh, uh, David says, polling suggests all the majority think Brexit has been bad for Britain. Fewer than half would vote to reverse it now. If we were to, re 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 if we were to rejoin, presumably the EU would offer nothing like the pre-Brexit arrangement. Would we need to join the single market and take on the euro? I suppose, well, that's probably another one for you, B Bruno. If, if Britain were to rejoin or try to rejoin, we wouldn't get our old terms back. No. Um, Britain's old terms, particularly its derogations, um, very significant ones on VAT, actually, which no one no one ever talks about that Barbara Castle got back in the 70s, uh, but also in terms of Schengen, that's the, the passport-free travel zone, also in terms particularly um, of the um, euro. Now, all of those derogations are gone. They were historically part of the UK's membership. The UK joined again, rejoined again. It would have to have a very brutal um, renegotiation. The EU is not, uh, UK is not particularly missed from the single market itself, that's the, 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 the customs union and free trade zone that is the um, EU. So it'd be a very nasty, well, very nasty, it'd be a very brutal uh, negotiation. The EU, uh, UK would have to give a lot, probably have to give even more um, on fishing than it gave back in the 1970s, for example, and it would not have those derogations. So Euro membership would become a legal commitment, whether or not the reality of it ever happening would be any closer is moot. But yeah, it would be, they would be difficult and unpleasant yeah. talks. Um, Marine, from a sort of business perspective, is there any expectation? I mean, if people, because it although it's been three years since we officially left, it's been nearly seven since we voted to leave. Is there any sort of business economic expectation of ever rejoining the EU? Have people drawn a line under that and business adapts actually probably more quickly than politics to, well, this is where we are now and we just need to get on with it? Um, I think business people, CEOs, suffer sometimes from a lot of the delusions that you might see across the wider population about what rejoining means. And also, as 
as sort of Bruno gave us a cold, harsh reality of what it would mean. <laughs> I think a lot of business people don't understand that the UK rejoining an EU means the UK paying more into a bigger EU budget, the UK being part of joint borrowing structure, something it's classically resisted and not liked um, taking part in these big grand leaps of integration, which happened after 2016. Um, a lot of business people, I think, quietly think that Kia Starmer and Rachel Reeves, although they are not really putting out too many ambitious claims of what, what they would like to do. I think their secret hope is that Labour Labour's plan is ultimately not to really do anything that would prejudice something that would look like getting back into the single market and customs union in the future. So you may have noticed that Labour don't talk very much about trade deals, because why would you want to prejudice your future um, re, I think, realignment back to the EU by having trade deals with other countries, which might mean changing regulations, etc. So that's probably the only, I think, real, slightly realistic and latent hope that you hear among yeah. business people. Their more immediate concern is the fact that they want people from the European Union back into the UK's labour market to fill jobs that they can't hire domestically. And that's to do with uh, uh, freedom of movement, which is obviously ultimately now is just within the control of the government. I mean, um, are business people or people more broadly wrong to think that Keir Starmer is going to move back towards the EU? Well, look, it's all a spectrum. Would he move back towards the EU? Yes. Would he move back towards the EU by anything like the amount that uh, some people think are deluding, I think, themselves that he might? No. Yeah. Uh, I mean, actually, Labour have been very categorical that under a Keir Starmer government, they will not rejoin the single market or the customs union. Whether that might happen a little bit by the back door, maybe. Although, I mean, on trade, I mean, um, Labour hosted this um, huge, I mean, they were trumpeting it, this huge trade reception with various ambassadors, such as the ambassador to America, uh, Australia, I think, last night in an attempt to say, look, we actually are going to try and make a sort of mercantilist version of, of Brexit work. I mean, I think there's a case that the politics are moving a little bit faster than Keir Starmer. But if you think about it, how is Keir Starmer going to get Labour back into government? It's going to be uh, the path is by winning back over voters who uh, voted Labour for years and years and years, perhaps went via UKIP, but eventually to the Conservatives in 2019. Um, if Labour wins those voters back, they are going to be incredibly wary about then repelling them again in time for the next yeah, election. Yeah. Um, and so I cannot see a world in which they say, oh, actually, uh, we were just we were just joshing with you. Um, you know, we're getting our EU berets out the door <laughs> uh, and taking us back in. It, it, it's just not it's just not going to happen. It's just funny, Henry, we talked a bit about the economic parallel universe, uh, but we was really good on that as to what Britain might have looked like economically had we voted to stay in. What would we look like politically? That's a great question. I mean, I think I'm slightly being provocative for the sake of it, but I, I have a, a long-standing theory um, that if Remain had won by 52 to 48, the Conservatives would have then made Boris Johnson leader as the tribune of their members, almost all of whom would have voted to leave the Euro European Union, even on that um, result. Uh, and, of course, Jeremy Corbyn would still have been leader of the Labour Party. And... Uh, though you wouldn't have had the get Brexit done kind of uh, theme in that election, I think we probably would have ended up with Boris Johnson being Prime Minister with something like a majority of 80. Um, so perhaps the counterfactual universe might not have been politically quite so different uh, from uh, from uh, where we ended up. It would have all been the same for everyone apart from Theresa May. Oh, yeah, I forgot about her. <laughs> <laughs> Spent three years covering her Brexit and there, negotiations. And there, there summed, up, summed up most of our, uh, our working lives covering Brexit um, in a single sentence. Listen, it's been absolutely fascinating. We had so many questions. Uh, but I hope if we didn't get to yours, uh, that we at least got sort of near them. Uh, uh, thank you to all of the Times readers who posted comments, uh, po uh, questions online. Uh, thank you to Henry Zeffman, Associate Political Editor of the Times. Uh, Maureen Khan is the Economics Editor of the Times. And Bruno Waterfield, uh, the Times Brussels correspondent. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for watching along on YouTube and on the Times uh, website as well. If you just tuned in and you want to catch and see if your questions were asked, you can catch on the Red Box podcast. A bit later on, wherever you get your podcasts from. Right, up next, uh, Mariella will be here with the coffee break. Uh, we're going to find out uh, that why MPs are investigating when they have to fess up and admit they got things wrong, correcting the record in the House of Commons. And we're going to lift the lid on being Conservative Party chairman. All that after we get the very latest from Cara Bentley. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker.